there, there was a political agenda behind Darwin. It wasn't just like objective science emerging and taking over. There was always political objectives on both sides. Hello and welcome to another Mind Matters show. Today joining us, we have Matthew Arrett, journalist and owner of two websites. One is the CanadianPatriot.org, and the other is the RisingTideFoundation.net. And we're very happy to see you with us today, Matthew. We have a lot that we want to talk to you about. Yeah, it's great to be on. And, and like I, I said, I, I've really enjoyed your show. It's one of the few oases of, on the internet in the alt media world where you can get some real substantial ideas and discussions. So I really appreciate that. Well, we appreciate you. And funny story, uh, the Mind Matters guys were talking about your work one evening and how we'd love to sit and chat and discuss a few things with you. And lo and behold, several hours later, we saw your <laughs> comment to our Erda Rule show on YouTube. And that seemed to clinch it. You know, that, that was the universe saying, it's time to talk to Matthew. So again, we're super happy to have you with us today to talk about Erda Rule and a whole lot of uh, dots that you connect in history that most people are largely unaware of. I know I've been unaware of many things that I've read in your articles that we've been seeing on SOT.net and on your own website. And um, I thought I'd start today with uh, one piece that just, to me, explains so much of what we're uh, seeing today, especially in the area of science and politics. And the title of your article was How Thomas Huxley's X Club Created Nature Magazine and Sabotaged Science for 150 Years. And if anyone's ever looked at or, or read uh, science journals, you'll know that Nature Magazine is uh, one of maybe two or three or five that are these kind of establishment bastion uh, cornerstones of accepted science and, and review. And uh, they're rather insulated and very protective of the ideas that they put forth and go on the attack mm -hmm. towards ideas that are unorthodox or one would say are outside of the box. Yeah. Um, so in the context of COVID-19, you take a look back at what you called or, or what was established as Thomas Huxley's X club and the establishment of nature magazine. And, uh, this was a, a very pro Darwin philosophically, uh, establishment magazine that mm -hmm. as you explain in your article, uh, was put out there as a kind of alternative to the hard power that was quite often, uh, the way that, the British Empire expressed itself in the world aggressively and overtly. And in response to Link Abraham Lincoln and some of his colleagues' new kind of view of the world uh, or um, where there was cooperation and, and where uh, war, universal war would not be the, the rule, but mm. rather universal cooperation would be the rule, uh, you had this group of elitists uh, decide that they had to go about things in a different way. And I, I wonder if you can discuss that and kind of underscore some of the main points of that piece, because uh, it speaks so much to how uh, Darwinism has become this firmly entrenched, uh, almost monolithic idea in the minds of the West and, and scientists, uh, despite many ideas to the contrary. But let me stop there and, and, and let you take off in that direction, because... Uh, just a wonderful piece. Well, thank you. Yeah, that, that's a that's an interesting entry point. I, I yeah, thank you for for posing the question the way you did. Uh, yeah, indeed, a lot of people wonder sometimes. I think how it is that um, certain scientific theories uh, perpetuate themselves over many generations, and uh, it, it's like there's some the 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 thinking is often well, there must be something really true about it, otherwise it would have been replaced by a different theory. 
And that's very naive. Uh, there's a there's very strong political agendas that often uh, reinforce and keep certain lines of thinking or certain narratives that um, put our minds in a certain uh, box by which we have to look out of that box from a filter that's very skewed to try to explain natural phenomenon, whether in physics or whether in uh, life sciences. And Darwin, yeah, like that, that was one of many theories in the 19th century. And, um, you know, people often forget that there were other theories that were accounting for the evolution. I mean, it was becoming more and more obvious that life was not this fixed thing that just came into being, you know, uh, 6,000 years ago, you know, from nothing, um, according to a literal biblical interpretation. There were, there were other scientists grappling with the, the appearance of fossils and the obvious uh, increase of biodiversity over time. And they were coming up with, well, what is the mechanism that would answer uh, what makes this happen? You have people like um, uh, Silliman, who ran the American um, scientific journals, or James Dwight Dana. Um, there, uh, Carl, Carl Ernst von Bayer was a German scientist who was part of the, uh, the Alexander von Humboldt network, um, who were all approaching this in very interesting ways, where they were all seeing, okay, well, there's obviously a directionality to evolution. There's a sort of... Um, what 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 is the 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 thing that decides what what species disappear and which ones come into being with new attributes new powers of organizing themselves and perpetuating their existence is it just random is it chaotic um or is there a directionality is there a flow is there a higher uh, design and they were obviously of the design school that there's an orientation towards this it wasn't all predeterministic but there was an orient there was a directionality now the the uh, British Imperial um, School of uh, of Science well, I doesn't like that. They didn't like that idea that there was a design in the world or that there was a, a harmony of the parts, that the whole biosphere is organizing itself and harmonizing itself uh, with a whole, a unifying principle in mind. Um, <clears throat> they, they prefer to keep things in a sort of uh, paradigm of conflict, that no, nature is is if we allow for an explanation, it has to involve the idea that nature is at war with itself and that the, the things that, that come about that, that, that replace uh, other species that are weaker only replace them because they were more fit to survive. They, they had an ability to develop an attribute that allowed them to kill off the weaker, to uh, have more sex, eat more of the food in a diminishing environment um, of diminishing resources which Darwin himself admits in his autobiography that this theory is something that arose entirely by his reading of Thomas Malthus's essay on, on the principle of population. And he describes it in his own words that, you know, it was only by reading that uh, all of nature and, and Thomas Malthus is talking about human beings, right? And he's working for the British East India Company's Halliburton School. So he's not exactly the most objective uh, economist, um, but he's talking about human beings and how his theory of population growth is that populations grow arithmetic, uh, geometrically, human population and uh, nature's abundance and agriculture grows arithmetically. And thus, you know, there you, you have these these charts uh, with the Malthusian sort of forecast that as population grows in this geometric way and the, the food resources grow arithmetically at, at a certain point, there's a forecastable collapse phase. Um, of tension that will cause the system to break down unless an enlightened elite can come in and manage the resources, uh, manage the population. And that's what they did with the, uh, the repeal of the Corn Laws in Ireland as a conscious effort to uh, undermine the population of the dirty Irish uh, that they just always, the British oligarchs always hated the Irish. And that, that's a whole story that goes back probably to the days of St. Patrick. And, and that's just another interesting story. But anyway, the um, <clears throat> Malthus had this really anti-human idea and, and Darwin loved it when he just read this thing on the I think he was on the Beagle when he read this, the, the essay. He was like, wow, that's it. That explains why there's all of these different phenomena in nature. And um, so, you know, his ideas didn't really get off the ground. Like people were kind of uh, disgusted, even amongst the British aristocracy, which was still very Anglican. You know, they had a lot of religious uh, un uh, attributes to the, the, the British elite itself, mm -hmm. which were which made them somewhat weak. Um, it was recognized that these attributes of, of having uh, Christianity embedded in your organizing structure, even though they didn't really follow Christian principles, it was recognized that 
politically and, and pragmatically, this was not expedient because it, these principles in the Bible, if you actually read the Bible, you start realizing that your, your way of doing things as an, a globally extended empire, whether it's the destruction of Irish or the undermining of the Chinese through opium wars or the, you know, the killing and controlled mass famines in India, these were all necessities of empire that were antagonistic, obviously, to the Bible and to principles of the New Testament. Um, so that was something that a certain figures, certain intellectual um, figures within the British intelligentsia realized had to be expunged and replaced with a more compatible um, religion um, that didn't have any pesky problems like d the divine or a natural, a, a moral natural law. Mm. And so that, you know, Darwin's theory fit the bill really nice. But again, as I said, even even amongst the British uh, aristocracy, th there was a lot of pushback. They, th there was something wrong. And, and also the, the Darwinian mechanism of, of random mutations on the small, mm -hmm. that ultimately everything was governed by just a, these, these little mutations within the species were just randomly just changing. Um, and, and every once in a while, it was like rolling dice, you know, and, and sometimes you'd get, you, you know, you get two sixes and, and you get lucky and all of a sudden you get like a bigger claw. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, or you get like six billion sixes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, um, <clears throat> they, didn't, they didn't like these things, uh, rightfully so. They were very offensive to natural reason. But um, Thomas Huxley, who was a, um, you know, he's a cynical, misanthropic guy who went through his own, you know, he, he wasn't part of the upper class. He wasn't part of a, a, a rich bloodline or anything, but he had creativity. Uh, he, he, you know, had to work as a, a surgeon's assistant, um, dealing with syphilis patients for years in the, the London ghettos. And he developed a really, really unhealthy hate for humanity. He, he hmm. became a little un, unkiltered. And, um, and, but he was very creative and, and he was a very funny guy, very witty. And uh, he started making, there's like, the, certain people saw his talent. Uh, certain people are like, okay, we can use this guy. He's got things we don't have. They were getting a little bit lazy and encrusted in their in their comfort zone for a few too many generations, you know. So they they had lost some of the the creative creative edge that that the that they needed in the face of the growth of republics and the growth of of the love of democracy that had just recently spread after in the wake of the American Revolution around the world. Mm -hmm. So people were getting um, ideas of independence that they didn't have before, and they were willing to sort of fight for higher ideals that they that didn't bother the empire before 1776. Mm -hmm. So that required a, a higher order of thinking. And so um, as Huxley became in increasingly uh, rewarded with higher positions of influence. He, he was made a leader within the British Royal, Royal Academy of Sciences. And he had a, he set up a battle plan to, um, to get using the control of collaborative media. Um, they created a, a lot of public debates with uh, religious fanatics of the Anglican church who were trying to defend the literal interpretation of the Bible. And they knew that their arguments were, you know, Huxley knew that these guys had really lame arguments, but set up these public debates between uh, himself, usually uh, defending the Darwinian view. Darwin himself had no social skills. He would not be trusted to go out in public and argue his own case. Uh, so Huxley was the guy who was usually yeah. his, called his bulldog. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it would be covered by the media in a, in a very strict way. They knew the outcome. Uh, Huxley was going to make fun of them, destroy their arguments. And, uh, and ultimately, people were led to believe that, oh, I have to either be a creationist or I have to be yeah. naturally a scientific Darwinist. I can't. There's nothing else. Mm -hmm. And they just pumped this for a few years. And, uh, and it, it increasingly uh, worked. But they still only had popular media on their side. They didn't have much else. Um, and so they created at a certain point, Huxley created a group called the X Club. That's actually their, their name. Uh, and uh, yeah, they, they started sort of a dining club that met once a month or so with uh, different uh, misanthropic scientists from various fields who, uh, from electro, you know, you know, you had Tyndall represent this, you know, physics. Uh, Matthew Arnold was a frequent guest. Herbert Spencer was a frequent guest, the guy who later came up with uh, social Darwinism. Um, which was always there anyway. It was called Mal uh, Malthusianism before that. And then they, they, they just changed the name uh, and, and call it social Darwinism and then eugenics under uh, mm -hmm. Francis Galton later on, uh, mm -hmm. Darwin's cousin. Um, 
but all of these, you know, there's about 12 or so of these characters who are mainstays and they, their idea was, okay, it's not enough just to um, have the media convincing certain people. We need to enshrine this, this theory as uh, a real scientific doctrine that's indisputable. And so they created nature magazine mm -hmm. um, coming out of that as sort of the tool that to this very day, is sort of the peer review standard of truth that if you get published in nature, um, that is as good as gold as far as like the new gospel is concerned. Um, and it's, into, you know, it's irrefutable at that point. You're untouchable if, if you get there or so they, they want to project. I mean, that's the mm -hmm. idea is control people's perception. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think that in short, uh, we could talk more and unpack this, but that was, that was <coughs> sort of the order of nature magazine. You know? Well, I've got a, a follow up on a couple of things that you said in there. Um, first was, so this, uh, Malthusianism and, and Darwinism into social Darwinism, you correct me if I'm wrong. You basically said this was a necessity of, um, basically keeping around the empire, keeping around imperialism because of the conflict with, uh, the actual Christian values that, that were supposed to have upheld the empire. Is that kind of what you're saying? Um, yeah, like the, the very existence of like Britain wasn't always an empire. Okay. Like yeah. Britain at first, if you go back to like Henry the seventh, um, in the, the end of the, uh, the 15th century, um, he was really an anti-imperialist. He was, uh, I mean, he took over from Richard, Richard the third, Richard the third was a, was a real, uh, Cretan. Um, <clears throat> but at this time, this, this is a Britain that was not the world financial center of the world. Uh, the city of London was a negligible part of world politics. Um, you know, and, and really this was, he was an admirer of King Louis XI, um, the founder of the first modern nation state. Um, and Louis XI uh, and Henry VII, who followed after him in, in that tradition, uh, were firm believers that to be a Christian uh, king, you had to be um, the, the instrument of God's will on earth, that you were a servant to your people. Mm -hmm. And so the, the legal reforms, the political economic reforms that were conducted under their reign, and also the crackdown on corruption in both of the countries was astounding. Um, both of the leaders were peace, like they worked really hard for peace treaties to get out of these controlled wars that were being funded by a certain international clique of financiers. And they both turned tre their treasuries from war, war chests into um, engines for what's called cameralism or later what was called dirigism, um, which was the, the, the investments into canals, schools, the, the teaching of orphans uh, to read, um, internal improvements. Mm -hmm. So that was understood to be, money had to be increasingly understood as a, a servant of the interests of the people um, instead of the interests of an imperial class. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that, that tradition um, unfortunately was undermined and I'm going to bring it back. I'm not, I'm not trying to deflect from your question. I, yeah. I just, some no, important I'm, content. Yeah, I'm seeing it. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, um, Henry the seventh kid, unfortunately, uh, didn't, wasn't such a good student of Thomas More. Like Thomas More was a really, a uh, great human being as was his friend Erasmus and many of these humanists, um, operating within that environment, um, in, in a leading position. You could read their writings and their letters, and and they're really, I mean, very politically astute unto the nature of the cultural warfare of empire, how to how to oppose it, you know, um, and um, and Henry the Eighth um, was unfortunately targeted for uh, an operation of deconstruction. He was psychologically worked on and worked on. His passions inflamed. He was given access to basically. Uh, People like Francisco Zorzi, um, the advisor to Henry VIII, who became sort of his marriage counselor, was a Venetian monk and a, a very slimy operative. He was a leading Rosicrucian mystic, actually, at the time, mm. who was uh, really, really satanic. And this guy was the guy who organized, um, you know, Henry VIII to marry Anne Boleyn and to uh, get rid of Catherine of Aragon. And all of these things it involved him just turning into a bit of a sex crazed maniac. He lost his bearings. He lost his moral principles. He killed Henry uh, Thomas More, you know, when Thomas More resisted his uh, desire to get a divorce and, and remarry, um, which had deep political ramifications. He cut off Thomas More's head um, and, and others, too. I mean, others had their, their lives sacrificed because they were trying to revive the Henry VII traditions. Um, 
And there was a fight for the next 100, 150 years, you know, um, whether a Britain was going to be a bastion of um, humanistic principles or whether it was going to be taken over by the Venetian oligarchy, which at that time had worked very hard to, pr to crush the humanist movement in uh, the Netherlands, which had developed a, a very strong uh, humanist fight against the Spanish Habsburg Empire. I mean, Frederick Schiller's um, um, Don Carlos gets at that in uh, in that story so the 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 fight of republicanism against empire you know and the, and, uh, and 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 this was something that was really the netherlands was a, was a bastard and that's also why i think you have so many great scientists and artists uh, emerging out of there in the 1600s um <clears throat> but that that was first worked on and crushed when uh, the venetian uh groups these these families that were sort of just carryovers from the roman empires uh, ruling empire, the ruling oligarchy. After the Roman, the Roman Empire collapsed, those families just sort of, you know, morphed and moved, doing the same thing, but under a new costume in Venice um, and also parts of Byzantine. Um, <clears throat> but so at that time, they had to crush, they were always like smothering out these like growing fires of, of independence movements uh, that were growing in steam. And so when they set up the Bank of Amsterdam as a, the world's sort of first private central bank in, in 1609, um, that was sort of part of their, their corruption, their takeover of smothering out the fires in the, in the Netherlands, which continued on. I mean, people like, uh, like Rembrandt were really trying to fight against this corruption in his time, uh, mm -hmm. 80 years later. Um, so was Christian Huygens' uh, father, who was a, a governor of the, ne the Netherlands and a sponsor of, of, uh, of uh, Rembrandt <clears throat> and a painter unto himself. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. So when the time came at around uh, the 1700 period, when uh, um, Jonathan Swift became a leading advisor to the government of Robert Harley, who was the prime minister under Queen Anne, there was a major fight for about a decade over whether they were going to permit this the glorious revolution, this, the sort of Dutch Ven Venetian takeover of, of Britain with, that happened in, in 1688. So they moved from after taking control of, of the Netherlands, they then moved to take control of Britain uh, in that in that sort of way. And there was a fight against that um, to try to keep Britain in a in an anti imperial sort of mo mode. Um, and they did that by creating a, a, an anti Bank of England because Bank of England was set up in 1694, right? modeled on the Bank of Amsterdam in 1609. So it was the same private central banking model of using debt slavery usury to try to get your enemies into a cage um, and just increasingly create speculation. Um, that, that had already taken over. Amsterdam was known as the speculative capital of the world and, and soon that became London under the South Sea bubble. Um, but so Robert Harley, uh, Jonathan Swift, uh, Daniel Defoe as well was a part of this network who did uh, Robinson Crusoe. Mm. Um, he wrote, they, they were all um, co-architects of the, uh, the National Land Bank, which was created uh, two years after the Bank of England. And it was done, you know, when you, when you read the legislation that, that these guys wrote, it was all done to uh, encourage the investments into manufacturers, into uh, it, canals, internal improvements, once again, instead of uh, wars with the Netherlands or wars with France. Actually, there's more wars with France. It was Britain and the Netherlands against France most of the time, or Spain. Um, so that land bank would have worked. The problem was it was it was undermined and turned into a speculative instrument that was part of the, that became part of the South Sea bubble later on that exploded, you know, in, in 1720. Um, Isaac Newton was a, was a part of that who lost his entire fortune speculating. Uh, while he was also the, the secretary of the mint of the Bank of England, then that's just, so you start seeing that there's the, the people that we didn't think were very, played a very big role in universal history. Like, you know, Jonathan Swift, Gulliver's Travels, uh, Daniel Defoe, mm -hmm. uh, on the other side of the coin, um, Isaac Newton or his enemy uh, Leibniz. Because mm -hmm. they, they, these were scientists. People think of these guys as like the inventor of the calculus. They don't realize that, no, you know, Isaac they were Newton political, very, very political, very, very controlled instruments. I mean, mm. he was a sociopathic narcissist who controlled the uh, the mint of the Bank of England and put thousands of people uh, to death for uh, counterfeiting coins. Um, after England stole massive amounts of coin um, of money from people during the Coinage Act, you know, where they basically took all your coins and then because anyway, there's clipping. There was certain. That's a whole other story. I realized yeah. <laughs> that I'm, I don't want to put up too many kinds of worms. So anyway, they, but yeah, they, they were very political, these people. And um, 
just like Darwin, you know, there, there was a political agenda behind Darwin. It wasn't just like objective science emerging and taking over. There was always political objectives on both sides. And a lot of the, the, uh, when, when Britain became more consolidated as an empire and that identity after, after the Jonathan Swift, Robert Harley factions lost out and Queen Anne died, um, actually, as a side note, Queen Anne's death in 1714. I was just reading, uh, I, wrote, I wrote an article on this, uh, on the art of political lying a few weeks ago. I think you guys even published it on uh, SOT. Um, Queen Anne, uh, it, it was, uh, all of the evidence points to the fact that she was likely poisoned to death. And her uh, physician at the time, um, her lead physician was uh, Daniel Malthus, the grandfather of Thomas Malthus who would have been the guy who uh, orchestrated her poisoning. Uh, wow. So that's, a, that's another thing. So her death really resulted in the destruction of the anti-imperial movement in, uh, in Britain. And hmm. at that point, it, they were sort of always downhill. And the problem was the, the, the Christian traditions were always antagonistic to the behavior, the practical behavior of the empire to destroy manufacturers, to keep your, the world subjugated and impoverished and ignorant. Um, in order just to keep your system alive. They, they couldn't, it, the very existence of intelligent, self-governing, sovereign individuals in the world that you were trying to dominate wouldn't permit for the types of absurd, immoral uh, customs and laws of empire to maintain themselves. People would naturally question like, why are we, why are we destroying our food crops for speculative purposes? Like, shouldn't we maybe not do that instead? And, and they would fight to stop it if they were thinking and they weren't, you know, induced to uh, reduce their identities to a status of live in the moment, you know, uh, bestialism, which is why the empire always promoted certain types of cultural movements in the arts and the music, in literature, in, in fiction, whatever else, everything that, that uh, tunes and awakens our passions. They wanted a very specific type of cultural matrix to uh, dominate their victims. Um, which cut out our the actualization of of what what it means to be human. So by the time the 19th century was rolling around, uh, the empire was making a lot of mistakes. There was a lot of internal resistance. Um, many people within the, the British House of Lords they wanted you know they had passed motions in in the House of Lords to uh, to get rid of slavery to uh, to disband as an empire to let the colonies go free. Like these there were real actual legitimate fights going on in the inner sanctum. And that was unacceptable. Um, they need, you know, they needed the empire to be coherent with itself. Um, and so, I would say the 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 thing with Nature magazine, just to go back to that quickly, is that it, it involved not just the Darwinian um, theory being ingrained, but it, they needed to take every domain of harmonics, physics, astrophysics. Um, you. And, and these different people who were participants of the X Club each represented leading aspects of each of the different schools of thought. And they needed to integrate it into a new unifying holistic system where no, none of the parts would be incompatible with the other parts, including the political economy side of things, um, which is where ultimately um, <clears throat> things like radical empiricism um, in the sciences became uh, promoted. The, the idea that your senses, you, all scientific fact has to be reduced to sensory data. Um, now, science never evolved that way. It, if you actually look at the history of science, it always evolved when people, you, people would have to obviously use their senses, but the discovery was never located in the deductive or inductive mode of reasoning located with the senses jumping back to abstract thinking or anything. It was always when um, you leapt outside of that with eurekas. Mm -hmm. um, into real discovery concepts and then transmitted the, that back metaphorically through your writings, through your speech to other minds that would then awaken the idea, which was more than the lo logical sum of the, the parts of the details of the, of the descriptive component. So the descriptive mm -hmm. empirical sciences sort of emerged out of that. Matthew, let me interrupt you real quickly because um, you, you did have a, a piece some time ago about uh, Einstein and a few other, maybe it was... Uh, Ohm or, or a physicist, and you made the point that that some of these heavy hitters were also musicians, and um, if I if I'm remembering correctly, it's a while back, uh, and that you know it speaks to this point you've just made about them using other parts of their minds in order to to come to their ideas of, and, and mapping of reality, and yeah. um, I, I regret that I didn't reread the article, but it was fascinating because you. 
you kind of established well how, how that works, how when you try and reduce everything to a certain way of thinking, you're leaving out whole portions of, of uh, the ability to come to some understanding uh, mm -hmm. through science. Um, could you expand a little bit on that? Do you, do you remember that piece? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it, it, I think it was Einstein, right? Who, who? Because uh, I, I used the two case studies in that particular article. I think mm -hmm. it was called the Plasma Universe and uh, a return to Max Planck's musical space time. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I used the case studies of of Max Planck and Albert Einstein, who, yeah, together, they they were both musicians. They both uh, would actually play uh, music together. Uh, Max Planck was a concert. He he could have been a concert pianist. And really, he describes how the thing that kept him in physics was one of his um, teachers at, um, I think it was at Jena, I forget which university, but one of his teachers basically told him, yeah, go, become a pianist. You're really good. And honestly, in physics, there's nothing left to really discover. It's just sort of ironing out the details. And Max Planck, he was like, no, there's no way that everything can be discovered. There's no way. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and that's, that's what, uh, got under his skin. And he's like, I'm going to prove him wrong and, uh, I'm going to make a discovery. Um, and he obviously went with the, uh, he was looking at black body radiation and, and there were certain paradoxes that were arising, um, in the black body, you know, when you would heat a black body of, of metal, usually uh, as the heat increased, light started increasing through and different colors as the heat increased, there was different colors being emitted by uh the black body as you see on your on your heating element you know um and the higher it got it the hotter it got it went from like you know <clears throat> orange to ye to yellow to white and then into the blues and then at a certain point it's a, it just disappeared it, it's it stopped increasing it, rather than in increasing the colors it, it you said you had sort of a drop off he's like why does it drop off does it just stop there so you have like this increase and then all of a sudden it it just decreases in the in the, the light spectrum and you're like why why is that why isn't it just increasing forever um and, uh, and so he's put himself to work figuring that out. And the whole idea of the quantum of, of, of action, that there's like little packets of what he called harmonic oscillators. He didn't call them like, he didn't attribute them the way people often describe uh, the, the photons today. He didn't think of it as like a particle of light, um, which is why people often say, oh yeah, Isaac Newton, he was right. Uh, light really does travel in little, little individual particles. He didn't think of it that way. He called them harmonic oscillators. There was like certain a certain idea of energy flux density in in there. So you had both a wave aspect of light, you know, that mm -hmm. in all directions, three hundred and sixty degrees, as you move away from a, a source of light, you had a reduction of the intensity of that in in sort of a wave flow. Yes, that's well, that was true. But you also had these individual packets as well. Um, again, the idea of harmonic oscillators, I think, is an interesting idea of of, of frequencies. Um, so he, he created a new field of science that came out of that. And, and Einstein helped, under, helped work very closely with him to understand what is really going on. And they would play music together. So Anna Einstein was a violinist, you know, and together when they would both describe in their own words that whenever they couldn't answer the problem mathematically that they were putting their minds to over many days and weeks and months, uh, they would often go to their, their, music, their instruments and play Mozart. They would play Beethoven. Well, Beethoven, Einstein couldn't handle Beethoven so much, but they would play Mozart together. Um, and, and by then after a few hours of doing this, just going back to the equations, answers, solve problems would, would be solvable. Their minds would be in a different space time, right? So they'd be able to look at it with, from a new sort of, uh, vision and answer the problems. Um, and they're not alone. Like there's a lot of scientists that have similar descriptions and it was more understood in the 19th century. Um, like the physics department at, uh, at Yena university. They had instruments for all the physicists. Uh, hmm. That was just something that it was sort of understood that if you want to be creative and productive in your scientific <coughs> thinking, you had to develop. Um, not had to. I mean, it, it, it was it was a desire. The, the word had and must. It wouldn't work if it was like a Kantian. I have to do this, and thus, you know, <laughs> thus encouraged. Huh? Encouraged. Encouraged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. It um, seems like it seems like that's that's naturally. Um... It's a it's a view of the mind and of the world that is totally lacking nowadays, or maybe not completely, but it's lacking in the materialist, Darwinist kind of mainstream mindset. The idea, but it, it makes perfect sense when you step outside of that, that when you're engaging in a musical activity, for instance, you're, you're, 
you're tuning into something you're 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 wanting to like david lynch was would put it catch the fish right there's this there's this fish out there in the ether in the in the in the whatever it is and you you know um you when you're when you're creative when you're looking for something it's it's an idea that comes to you and i you know i'm uh i i've I've played guitar for years I, i went to school for it and that's that's the way i kind of look at it too is it and a lot of musicians look at it like that that they're not if you ask them well who wrote this song sometimes they'll say well i didn't even write this song i think who was it um one of the Beatles was it John Lennon? Which song was it? Was it Yesterday? Yeah, because we watched. Yeah, we watched that movie yesterday, which was pretty fun. Uh, but the yeah, he woke up one day. We no, we watched the movie yesterday, <laughs> some time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen that one? Yesterday, it's a it's a yeah, fun yeah, kind of yeah. like rom com with uh you know where the Beatles don't exist and he remembers all their songs. But anyways, yesterday, I'm pretty sure that was the song where he woke up with the song in his head, and just wrote it down. Basically, you know, he'd never, he'd, he never, he didn't consciously put it together and compose it. Mm-hmm. It came to him and yeah. it doesn't always work like that. Right. So not all writers or artists have that, that moment of complete, in, uh, complete inspiration where it comes, com, uh, you know, completed and whole, but there, there's something to that process where, um, you, you're kind of opening up your mind to be able to receive something wherever it's from, you know, uh, there's all kinds of theories about what's going on in the subconscious and what the nature of the mind is. And you can argue about that, you know, um, but there's an aspect of inspiration to this and intuition to this process of, like you said, like putting ideas together when you get the gestalt, when you get the, when, when you have that, that flat, that eure- that Eureka flash. And so just with that kind of understanding, which you should get from just, life experience just living that okay you've got a bunch of scientists a bunch of physicists trying to figure stuff out well get them in the mindset that uh well in the state of mind maybe where you're receptive where you're at where you're being creative where things are being um put together and recombined and composed like as you say like in a different space time on some other level yeah, yeah. and then well, that, will, that will that will trans yeah. that that will translate it will translate into that other domain yeah Absolutely. And, and play is key, right? Um, Frederick Schiller, um, the, the great, I mean, I, I mentioned Don Carlos, um, the, the, the history play that was written by, by Frederick Schiller, um, who's known in Germany as the, the poet of freedom. And like all of his plays and all of his, his aesthetical theories, um, like his aesthetical letters, he's always getting at like, how do you um, resolve the, the seeming contradiction between us being a society um, a spontaneous society, you know, like we, we have our, our emotional state uh, and we have this log- logical side of ourselves. And if a society is organized or with, with a disequilibrium where it's, you know, uh, too much, um, I mean, he uses certain like politically incorrect language, you know, like, but if you have a society of what he calls the barbarians running the show, which he characterized as the, uh, the French, the problem with the French revolution was that it was a bar. It was a society where you had barbar- a barbarian culture in the elites, so that that he defined as being a society which is too uh, ivory tower, too in their own heads in the abstract world. You know, where people say like, "Oh yeah, I love humanity, but I hate people," you know, because uh, mm-hmm. they love the idea, <laughs> the idea of humanity, but they actually mm-hmm. don't. They haven't cultivated their own internal emotions. They they can't they can't actually talk to people mm-hmm. um, or or care about them. So you had that sort of stratification in the elite which had access to education and to culture and other things. And then you had what he calls the savage, the savage uh, culture in the masses where people were never given access to education or, uh, or a development of their intellectual identities. And so they were a society where the masses just lived in the pursuit of survival moment to moment. And so you had this sort of disequilibrium in that society that resulted in a complete devastating bloodbath in the uh, in the in the case of the French Revolution, which started off hopefully, you know, for the first couple of months, there was hope that it could be a successful Republican Revolution in France. Uh, but very quickly, all of the leading scientists who actually had a development of both their their minds and their hearts together and harmonized, like uh, Lavoisier, uh, people who had been working with Benjamin Franklin, uh, they they all found themselves uh, on the chopping block. And, uh, you know, the, the banner of the French Revolution quickly became the revolution uh, doesn't need scientists. And they just killed like all of their, their leading scientists and statesmen and astrophysicists who were also part of the Republican movement to get rid of uh, monarchical systems of control. Um, so Schiller's writings, he gets at the, the importance of play 
that the way to get out of this problem is to awaken the play instinct. And he's, he makes the point that a, a man can't really truly be a man if he does not play and you can't play unless you're a man. Um, and that's the thing that the Kantians are incapable of, of getting at because Kant says, yeah, you should do good. You're, you're, you should do your duty, but ultimately you can't ever really want to do your duty. It's just something you should do as a categorical imperative. Um, and, and when Schiller read that and, and Schiller's allies like the Humboldts, Alexander von Humboldt and Wilhelm von Humboldt, the educational reformers of Germany, who were also part of this group, um, they were all horrified. They were like, no, they're, they're, you're, the Kantian system destroys our ability to understand the natural role of play, of irony. This is where the thing that inspires people into moving their minds on their own free will and making Eureka's, uh, you're destroying that by getting people to just like do good because you should do good, you must. Mm -hmm. And Schiller makes the point, no man must, must. And I think music and arts, painting, things like that, they get you into that state of mind uh, where you're just having fun, right? And, uh, and it frees you from the shackles of your, of your logical um, part of yourself. And so then you could play with the logic. You could, play, and you could look for the cracks in the logic. Where, where, where do, do, do the, if I'm trying to make a discovery of something, obviously that discovery in science exist outside of the domain of the logical language that I'm utilizing because that logical language is the composite of everything that's only been discovered up until my moment now, but I'm mm -hmm. trying to discover something outside of there. So how do I make that leap? Right. And so I, I've got to take my, 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 my language, my logical language, whether it's that that's very descriptive and, and then look for where does it break down when I map it onto reality, where are the cracks and, the, and those cracks become the paradoxes, the, 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 the ironies that become more, interesting then all of the all of the the generic data is less important than where are the where are those ironies and in the case of like for example if you want to want a concrete example of that i think that a great one is kepler when kepler uh johannes kepler the guy who discovered uh certain laws of planetary motion like the elliptical nature of the orbits or the the equal area and equal time law um or the third law which was a harmonic law uh that came that we, we sort of descriptively after the fact called his uh uh you know the that there's a constant in all of the planets motion that there's a the, the cube of the mean distance from each planet to the sun has a certain relationship to the square of the periodic the periodicity of, of each orbit so there's a certain uh, cube to, to square relationship of each planet within the the solar system as a whole and he discovered that um over the course of 20 years um but the thing that allowed him to get, to get his entry point into that was looking at the paradox of uh, the retrograde motion of Mars. And so every, every single sort of standard model, a uh, descriptive standard model of planetary motion available to him that you had to adopt at, if you were going to be a respected scientist in his day, every single one of those models adopted certain uh, common assumptions, which which chose to just explain away the retrograde motion of Mars. You guys know what the retrograde motion of Mars was or is? No. Tell us, please. It's, it's, it's when you go back um, and, and look at the night sky, and, and obviously Mars jumps out because it's the only sort of red star. Um, and if you take a snapshot at, at the same time every night, Mars is at a different position, right? Mm -hmm. And every 687 days, the interesting thing is that uh, motion of Mars all of a sudden stops at, at let's say it's 8 o'clock at night, right? It, it all of a sudden stops. The next night, all of a sudden, it's the same place. The next night, it's all of a sudden going backwards again. The next night, it's going backwards again. And for two weeks, it goes backwards before stopping again and then continuing back on its track mm -hmm. for the next 687 days, which it does, you know, and the 687 days later, almost two years later, you can go back. And now it's at a slightly, the retrograde happens a slightly different direction, maybe, you know, two degrees uh, further to the, let's say, left or right, whatever, whichever direction you're looking at, mm -hmm. southern or northern hemisphere, right? But it, it all of a sudden happens at a different spot in the night sky. And they were all explaining, all, all of the scientists were saying, okay, the way we're going to account for this phenomenon is by just putting um, epicycles onto our, uh, onto our, our uh, model. And so, you know, you had your, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you got your sun in the middle, you got the planet, uh, the planetary um, orbit, which is, everyone said it had to be circles, couldn't be anything but circles. And because circles, you know, God made the universe and God is perfect and circle is the most perfect of, of all shapes. So everything must be circles, um, which I, I, I by habit, I, I did like an oval. But anyway, <laughs> um, and so what they basically said is 
let's say, <clears throat> so let, if this is Mars's orbit, then what we're going to do is we're going to put a little secondary uh, cycle around an invisible point that is going around, and imagine this whole thing is a circle, okay? It's going around the sun, and that, the, and that Mars is going to be on this little secondary small orbit going around at a constant motion. This is going around at a constant motion. And by doing this, Mars would then have this sort of, uh, you know, there'd be this sort of pathway charted out by Mars's motion mm. over time around the sun. And there were di different variations on that, whether it was Tycho Brahe's version that, or whether it was Ptolemy's version or Copernicus's version, they all had a different configuration where they all obeyed equal uh, constant motion, cycles upon cycles that are called epicycles with little equants that are these like invisible uh, points uh, around which everything moves in equal distance, uh, equal speed. And Kepler's like, well, that's a lot of uh, add-ons that God had to create in our solar system. If every planet is doing this at different in different proportions, mm -hmm. that's a lot of absurd, unnecessary stuff that's been created just to account for this thing you're visually seeing. Mm -hmm. He's like, is there not a simpler, more elegant answer to this? Um, which this is where the opening by proving that there was like an ontological paradox, like an imp impenetrable, you, you, the logic of this system of description totally broke down at a certain point. And, and that, that, that break, that, that paradox that people couldn't run away from allowed him then to introduce a higher hypothesis, which took the form of, well, maybe it's not circles, right? Maybe it's ellipses, mm -hmm. uh, which are just sort of slivers of a, of a cone, a conic section. And, uh, and, you know, then that allows us now to move our minds in a totally different domain. And he's very playful. The guy's poetic. So if you read Kepler's writings, he's a poet. And that's why he calls his book, uh, uh, it's, it's a beautiful book. You can even order it. It's been 400 years it took him to actually translate this into English, but you can order the harmonies uh, of the worlds online. And uh, really something, it, but it's, it's, it's entirely based on a musical hypothesis. So he's like, it, is it possible that there's a musical coherence in all of the planetary motions and the distance? Like, why are all the planets um, moving around the sun at these different intervals where they are? Is it just random? Or is there a higher musical coherence and reason? And which... He, by the way, he, he discovers the third law by proving that that's so. That's why he called it this <laughs> and not the disharmony. And he does it politically. He's actually dedicating this to uh, James I. That's the, on the dedication page, who he's trying to persuade as a new king of, of England. Now, he's in Germany. But England, you know, as I said, there's this fight to keep England from becoming an empire. And James I is being induced to take on an imperial sort of modus operandi. Um, declaring unnecessary wars all over the place. And he's like, well, and Ke you know, the, the Kepler is writing this right before the Thirty Years' War really kicks off. Actually, the Thirty Years' War has, has at this point begun. This is 1620. And, uh, and his father dies. You know, his father was a mercenary in the Thirty Years' War that just, it killed half of Germany. Half of Germany died in the Thirty Years' War. Like the whole Black Forest was wiped out. It was like brutal, like, like Aleppo today, you know? Um, and, uh, in, in the light of that, his way of intervening on that as an, is to go into astrophysics and try to prove that the universe is harmonic and then to persuade the, the different kings and, and different puppet leaders that you're doing things all wrong. You know, like we, we, it, it's not just the Bible that says we should, we're made in God's image, but it's provable that God made us in his image because I discovered a, a part of God's mind by looking mm -hmm. into my own mind. And, you know, there's this coherence uh, scientifically. And well, he's like, okay, so there's obviously political ramifications to this being true, you know? <laughs> and, and I think that oh, if you look at a lot of the, the great scientists like Benjamin Franklin, um, he was talking about, you know, Kepler or, or uh, Ben Franklin's teacher like Cotton Mather or uh, John Winthrop. They were all uh, scientists in the pre-revolutionary period in Europe. And they were all okay. studying Kepler, oh, translating Kepler. Is that it? Oh, can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah, no, sorry. Um... I was going to jump in and, and say something because you were, you, you've said like so much and, and a lot oh, of it is, is just really interesting. <laughs> um, no, no, it's great. Like you are, you know, super knowledgeable and you can just, you can tie in everything together in this beautiful harmony. Um, 
which is something that strikes me about a lot of these um, different theories of uh, whatever it is. Uh, we'll take we'll take a natural selection and random mutation as as but one example, where mm. you you start off with a kind of absurd premise, and then in order to justify it, you have to come up with an even more absurd premise. And then in order to justify that, you just have to keep going with even more and more absurd premises where, you know, in order at this point for them to continue justifying natural selection and random mutation, because we know that mathematically speaking, it's impossible for those things to be true. But the way that they get around it is by saying, oh, we just happen to live in the un the one universe in like, you know, however many trillion where everything has gone perfectly right such that we are here and everything's gone that way. And it, and like, I was just saying it's just building upon absurdities to yeah. just an unbelievable degree when really it's a lot simpler <laughs> and a lot more elegantly beautiful than that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, to yeah well have said, something... those are exactly like the, the epicycles. That's exactly the same yeah, thing. Yeah. Over thousands yeah. of years, they were just finding ways of putting more and more epicycles to the point that Copernicus' system, which technically has the sun in the center, it's mm -hmm. only technically you could remove the sun from Copernicus's model and nothing changes because everything's not really moving around the sun. It's actually moving around a spot a few thousand miles from the sun. Yeah. There's a, like this invisible mathematical uh, equant that he makes this whole system work around. So, and then from there, if you look closer at the Copernican system, there's not just one, but there's like four different uh, ep epicycles and sub epicycles on Mars's motion. So Mars is going around another one visible circle, which is going around another invisible circle, which is going around another invisible circle, which is going around the sun, which is not really the sun. It's a, a spot next yeah. to the sun. So it's like they're just keeping because as your data becomes more refined and you get more evidence, and more information on where the actual positions and distances are of the, of mm -hmm. the, the planets, the more you it, it, it proves that you're out of whack, like your model doesn't work. So you have to just either change your model the way Kepler does or if you're lazy or dishonest simply yeah add more absurd layers yes and epicycles which is what the darwinians have done yeah and that is yeah, another thing too, right? if, you, if you actually yes. look at the, the global yes. warming models uh not not that long ago it was becoming i mean people were, were accepting the fact that the global warming sort of stopped about 14 years ago in 2001 or so it sort of like started tapering off now they've tried to start uh, uh change the google searches so you can't even find that data for some reason but anyway but they were, we're accepting that for a while. The second and, and wave. I actually had climate scientists come up to me and I was, I was talking to them and they were like, yeah, yeah, you didn't know that the, the, the cooling is caused by the warming? <laughs> it's like, whoa, you would have said that five years before you just said that? Like, what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, no, exactly. It's only later on when they have, when they have incontrovertible evidence that they can't just dismiss away. Like, it's in their face now. They have to deal with it. And so the only way they can deal with it is still by kind of like brushing it aside in this weird and absurd way that doesn't make any rational sense and wouldn't have fit in their original like premises like they had yeah. to come up with something totally new and irrelevant or irrational well that's just yeah. how people are right i mean yeah. this is like this is one of the things we kind of do on our show is to bring it something like sometimes we'll get into specifics like we'll talk about politics a bit but then we try to bring it down to like psychology or philosophy or something like just on a kind of a different level it's like in personal like interpersonal relationships when you've got a, a strong belief about something or or a strong interpretation about an event that has happened maybe an emotional encounter that you've had with your significant other or someone or a family member and then you get called on it and then you just keep coming up with excuses and they become yep. more ridiculous and more ridiculous as, as you dig yourself deeper into the hole. Right. And, <laughs> and that's just the, what we're, so what we see like in all these scientific theories is just that very basic element of interpersonal re relationships and, and psychology just in the, the, the public domain and the scientific domain. And like, if you read the emails that scientists send each other, they they sound like toddlers just getting in fights over things, right? They, there's they can be completely rude to each other and just not listen and swear at each other. And <laughs> like when you, if you look behind the scenes at, at at scientists, it's 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 like you know it's kind of like seeing your parents naked when you're a little kid. It's like you don't want to see it because it's it's, <laughs> it's very uncomfortable and it it shatters so many illusions that you've had about them. So, um, but every once in a while, you know, it's necessary just to kind of show that. <laughs> that these people you know they're, 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 there's not there's nothing 
great about scientists Nothing necessarily. Magical. There are some great scientists, right? Mm-hmm. Just like there are some like total inspirations that are that are total geniuses. And um, but most of the guys that you'll that you'll see on TV and the and uh, the, you know the people that are holding up the the mainstream view of things are just when it comes down to it, they're pretty much they're pretty average on so many other levels. And when you so when you see these. When you see all of these epicycles in in the theorizing and like to, to the point where, as a result of developments in like in biology and in microbiology, the argument gets to the point like like you said, Adam, where you have to say, oh, well, there are actually an infinite number of universes, and we just happen to be in the one where this happens, which isn't an explanation for why things happened here, right? You can use that in, as an explanation for anything. It may be true that there are an infinite number of of universes, but it doesn't explain, it, it can't be an explanation because it's not an explanation. It just says, oh, well, this must have happened. It's like, well, how was this cup made? Well, I must be in the universe where this cup just happened to be here. Well, no, there was actually, you know, there was a, a, a way in which it happened and there are reasons for why every step in the process did happen. But, uh, yeah, yeah. well, anyways. <laughs> the example, like, yeah, you, uh, yeah, like, like, uh, imagine you had, how did, how did the cake come into being? Oh, well, I, I, you know, I just, I had all these ingredients in my hand. I fell down the stairs. And by the time I got to the bottom yeah. of the stairs, I had a cake. Uh, so, well, maybe, <laughs> sure, you could, you could explain mm-hmm. something away like that. But, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's really absurd. It's really, it's lazy mindedness uh, mm-hmm. to, to a very high degree, for sure. And then with that, um, trying to bring things together in a, in a way, um, you have two kind of, well, you know, maybe multiple avenues here, but one of, one of them being uh, a more nefarious minded group. So like the X group who had a very clear uh, goal in mind, which was to further empire. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, you know, got a great influence on society and where things go. And so we have to keep that in the back of our minds as to why things out the play the way that they do. And then there's also the human, uh, just natural human aspect, like you were saying, Harrison, with just, you know, the, um, the problems of people getting attached, emotionally attached to ideas or, uh, or outcomes or, or being right or, or what have you. And so it becomes a a really big mess because, Mm -hmm. you know, again, on the one hand, you have the people who are trying to control, uh, things for, you know, uh, individual gain. Uh, and then there's just, you know, people not wanting to be wrong. Um, and so it creates this mess. And and the way I kind of want to tie this together is... It's all in Earth rule. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly where I was going. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Before you go there, because I want to go there. I want to go there. Okay. Um, but, but I was just thinking about something that I didn't want to lose um, <laughs> that touched on what we were just saying about the the whole, like, luckily we we existed in this part, like... The, the, the formula was just right in our little part of the universe. And so, you mm-hmm. know, life came about and, and just happened to be uh, the way it is. <clears throat> but uh, that's one of the problems too with the, you know, the entire 20th century has really been derailed because, you know, we brought up Max Planck and Einstein. They were mocked um, in their lifetime for being of the old generation who denied the new discoveries of the Copenhagen School of Quantum Mechanics. Um, and th- this is the, the school around Niels Bohr and Max uh, Heisenberg that basically s- they said, okay, the way that we're going to resolve the new paradoxes that were emerging in the quantum was by um, solving it through the assumption of randomness. So just like Darwin sort of solved the problem of why species come about through the idea of random mutation and ran- you know, so all- obviously it's this like invisible wall beyond which your mind can't tr- uh, transgress. They did this. They said the same thing now for the atom, and we're just going to say that there's a, a randomness function going on on the small, and and this is where people sort of misunderstand why Einstein and also Planck said God doesn't play dice with the universe. They didn't want it. They couldn't accept. They're like maybe there's another set of organizing principles that you just haven't discovered yet because you're not being very creative, mm-hmm. and you're just running away from that fact by just creating another mechanism of randomness and statistical probability theory sort of just became the tool that was used to describe where an electron might be, where a a photon might be. Because obviously you can't, as soon as you try to see something like a photon, the very act of seeing it requires that a photon hit the photon to jump back to your eye to be absorbed, you know, into whatever apparatus you're measuring it with, which causes it to move. So you can't know the position plus the momentum of it. You You can only know maybe one of the two and even that imperfectly. 
So rather than make a discovery, a whole new system that became known as the, the standard model of cosmology on the large or the standard model of uh, quantum theory on the small, it's pretty much the same thing where they tried to absorb uh, Einstein's relativity and absorb uh, Planck's uh, constant into their, their explanatory system, but denying the principle of creative thought and musical thought that gave birth to those very ideas mm. that they then wanted to use and put in its, its own little cage. But a whole, I mean, trillions of dollars and godless, I mean, uh, godless, yeah, godless, uh, <laughs> hours the shoe fits. of, of <laughs> yeah, godless <time> hours <laughs> energy have been pulled into building bigger and bigger tests using, you know, particle accelerators and every, and it's great that we have these particle accelerators and, and CERN and it's all great that we have this, the, the, these machines that are out there that can get us uh, empirical data by smashing things together. But, you know, they, they've put years of work into pursuing things like the God particle, which they finally discovered, I think, in like 2012 or 2011. They, they discovered the God particle. And this was supposed to be the particle that was going to, like, explain how mass exists. How, how does coherence exist? And they're like, finally, we got it. We, you know, they smash things together just the right velocity. And they, they found something bounce off of the, the explosion that they then were like, okay, that is the thing. And it's like, what changed? What, what power of discovery did that give you? Nothing. Nothing changed. Um, that by the, and, and part of this whole thing was that they don't want to accept Kepler's discovery of the har of the harmony of the universe, which came before Newton. So 80 years before Newton came up with, with his, uh, laws that he called gravity. And Newton is very much like a Darwin character in this whole story. Um, Newton was a bit of a, a black magician, autistic, uh, character who was a sociopath, uh, and a political agent, kind of like a composite of, of sort of like a Barack Obama character, you know, like there's nothing really there uh, behind the hologram. It's like a composite of, of, of impulses and desire for sex. It's nothing. <laughs> but but you, you look at um, where the discoveries that we attribute to Newton, like gravity, where did they actually come from? And, and the, the gravitational equations of the inverse square law are all directly derivable from Kepler's um, discoveries, from Kepler's equations mixed in with a little bit of uh, Huygens' work on, on uh, centrifugal motion, um, including and also one of Kepler's leading defenders, uh, Gottfried Leibniz, who discovered the calculus based on a challenge that Kepler threw out to future generations of mathematicians to discover how do you create a language of, of nonlinear change? Because, you know, with the elliptical orbits, you have like change happening at every moment in the orbits. There's no constants. So how do you create a language of that type of nonlinear uh, changeness that, that happens with all curvature in physical space time? And so Leibniz took the challenge up a few decades later and, and succeeded. All of these things, like the calculus, are attributed to Newton for some reason, and, and gravity is attributed to Newton and his work on optics. Which, if you, So again, the, the people who made the discoveries were not Newton. They, they all happened way before Newton did. Um, so there's obviously, again, political objectives to hollow out those discoveries, to destroy the idea of the harmony um, of their minds, the musicality of their minds, and then just give, allow only the descriptive shell to remain that you could then maybe use, but you can't improve upon. You can't get insight into the nature of the universe that way or the nature of your mind. Mm -hmm. um, so the God, I mean, if, if you, if you were to approach things uh, today in quantum physics, the way that Einstein or Planck, who are both followers of Kepler, they both write about their understanding of Kepler. They read his writings. They, they fought to get people to, uh, also study it, which they, which their followers refused to do. Unfortunately, very few of them did. Um, <clears throat> that you wouldn't, it wouldn't be a paradox why there is such a thing as mass. You know, you wouldn't need to pursue ex hitting particles together to explode them to get the the God particle because Kepler didn't have an idea of gravity as such. He had an idea of coherence. Why is there universal coherence? What are the harmonic intervals? What, right. And, and what are the, the purposes of the disharmonies? He also has a special role for the dissonances, things that sometimes people call the devil's interval of like, you know, uh, fa sharp and do. You know, there's certain, there's certain keys that just, they, they don't resonate well. We know scientifically later on, like now, why some, on, on one level, those wavelengths are, are interfering with each other, but they just also, they don't, they don't resonate with the, the soul very well, but they can be used, like Beethoven used them a lot. Um, but always for a resolution, right? So you can you can create controlled dissonances, kind of like the same way a painter would control shadow um, in a painting to get a better effect of chiaroscuro. Um, so the, all of of physics really needs to be, I think, uh, revised at, with a better 
sort of uh, a better filter, right? That's more coherent with the laws of nature, um, which are provably so. And that you could you could see that people like um, um, you know some of the anti-Darwinists, like Karl Ernst von Baer, who was part of the uh, the German uh, school of Keplerian scientists of the 19th century, he had an idea of a morphogenetic field in the 1830s and 40s. Um, that there is a harmony of parts. Even Lamarck, uh, the French scientist, had an idea of a harmony of the parts, right? How do places, things work together? And they were all political. And, and so the idea of a harmony of interests, the harmony of agriculture, of industry, of uh, the bourgeoisie, so-called, and the, uh, the masses, that, there, that they, there wasn't necessarily any, any uh, class struggle you had to assume was built into the fabric of, of nature or of huma humanity. That you know, if you do things with an idea of creative change embedded in your mind, you can always have a harmony of interests of win-win uh, processes. That was what made America such a threat to the empire, the better America, and and it was, you know, increasingly understood as being something that was going to replace empire structures, especially after the Civil War. So. Um, yeah, this whole randomness thing really, really screws people up. And that's why Ertegrul is awesome. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. J just, a, just one quick comment before we right. get into Ertegrul. Just, just a little, just tiny, and then we can launch into it. We tiny, can talk about tiny. the beer. <laughs> what we've been waiting for. <laughs> yes. I, and it's just this. Um, it, it seems to be no coincidence uh, that Albert Einstein was a highly moralistic individual. Uh, and and actually spoke out uh, about political issues in his day, and you know, according to my perspective, held the right positions about imperial uh, behavior, especially in the Middle East. Uh, I, I can't speak to what Planck uh, thought politically, but it seems to me that this whole uh, approach to to science was also uh, part and parcel of who he was as a human being, and his and his whole outlook on. Uh, the, the correct uh, behavior of nation states and and of individuals and uh, and and that whole thing. So it it does it seems that there is a a, a core a strong correlation, uh, at least based on my understanding of of Einstein's thoughts between this this kind of thinking outside the box and and these harmonics and this approach to physics that speaks very much to uh, humanistic values and and uh, non-imperial approaches to uh, politics. Yeah, And absolutely. now we can go into Erdogan, <laughs> unless you want to say anything about that. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I would just say like, a lot of people attack Max Planck because he stayed in Germany um, after the Nazis took over. And they say, well, look, why wasn't he like Einstein? Einstein left early on um, as a pacifist. Why didn't he leave? And, you know, that's a bit naive because he was a patriot of Germany, but he didn't like the Nazis. He wanted to defend, he saw himself on the front lines defending the soul of Germany and the better traditions of Germany that were antagonistic to fascism. Um, so he was very courageous. You know, his son also was executed by the Nazis because his son was part of the uh, the assassination plot against Hitler in uh, 45, Ooh. or was it 44? It might've been 44. Anyway, um, you know, he definitely imparted these principles and values into his, his son and, um, and, uh, Einstein was also super moral. Like he was part of the civil rights movement before there was a civil rights movement. He was working with Paul Robeson. He was working with Henry Wallace, um, advocating for an anti-imperial post-war World War II order. And um, people often you know, also attack Einstein too, frankly, um, for being um, you know a promoter of world government and all of that. And and uh, you know I don't think that that's fair either because he was politically naive on some levels too. Like. Bertrand Russell, who was a very nefarious character in, in the story of world history, um, was able to um, seduce Einstein intellectually about what Israel could be, um, about what world government could be. And there were, you know, world government at the time wasn't the same thing as the new world order idea today. You know, you had an idea in Einstein's mind and in many moral people of those days that, yeah, we, we need to destroy empire and have a world um, of, of, of harmony. Essentially, we are one world, one system, and, and we need to cooperate together to develop infrastructure and end hunger and poverty and create education for everybody. And, you know, Einstein was of that view. So I, I just want to say, because some of your listeners might not like Einstein, um, I've met tons of people who, who think that he was like an evil tool or something in disguise. And they just, there's a nuance there, right? Like he made mistakes, but 
he was a good human being and, and he devoted himself to humanity and, and so did Max Planck. Yeah, if you want to talk about Ertrugel, we can do that, sure. <laughs> yeah, let's let's move on to Ertrugel. Because, I mean, we've talked about uh, tyranny. We've talked about inspiration and, uh, you know, a, a, an alternate worldview to the to the kind of bland black Plain and white death like, dead dead philosophy that we that we have mm-hmm. you know that's so prevalent today so it was just uh in our show we were just kind of so excited to to find a show that was not only entertaining but actually had some substance to it and managed to basically show another way of being you know but i just want to hear what you think about the show just i was surprised to uh to find it as well like i was happy that you guys because I've been trying to tell people uh, in my network to watch this show, and mm-hmm. I, I haven't been very successful overall. <laughs> uh, like Six hundred episodes, you know, um, or you know, some people would say, "Oh, it's Turkish propaganda." I don't want to. I don't want to do that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, a friend of mine in uh, in California who runs a website told me I should check it out, and you know, I'm always looking for a way to just like yeah, just relax sometimes when I'm when I'm not doing political writing or or, or lecturing. I, I want to just like watch a show. I want to watch a movie, but half the time, more than half, far more than half the time, I'm sure you guys can identify with this you just feel afterwards like you just wasted your time like mm-hmm. i could have done something productive and now i just you know binge watched a stupid show and you know it, i don't want to feel that regret <laughs> mm-hmm. so i was happy that you know after a few episodes of this air to show i'm like okay there's something there there's really and maybe maybe what caught my attention at first was some of the cool fight scenes or something yeah but yeah very quickly you're like oh there's more to this than uh, than meets the eye and uh, and so I was really happy that you guys also tapped into this um, when I when I started watching your uh, your Mind Matters show. And um, <clears throat> I think that there's uh, I never thought that I would watch what is it like 600 episodes and be like at the end, oh man, it's over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> never thought I would say that, uh, but it, there there it happened. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite the phenomenon, eh? <clears throat> yeah. The phenomenon. Um... Just a few of the aspects. I can't remember how much we spoke about them in in detail when we talked about the show, but the things that stick out in mind, like just immediately, are first I mentioned well tyranny and inspiration as like my lead into the to this topic. There is this strong identification of basically political evil that yeah. that there is that there there can be and there is something wrong often with a certain um status quo or the, the the way things are the nature of the leadership and and that there is an ideal like a, a lot of you know people get written off as as dreamers or like you know John Lennon imagine type people if they mm. if they if they even look at the world and have any criticism of it like or look at the state of things or criti- criticize governments and there's all kinds of there's all kinds of attitudes like that but in air in air to rule you have just a, a stark reality of what's going on and then you have this character and not just one character but a character with with allies you know you can say a, a community of people who have this ideal have this um well first they have a clarity of vision to see what what the reality on the ground is but also an, uh, a, a religious ideal in this case of yeah. what things could be and yeah. And just a total um, determination and um, like motivation and commitment. Commitment. That's the word I'm looking for. A commitment to to getting to it and to not be corrupted along the way. Yeah. And I just thought I think we're we're still only on like uh, on season three, so we're we're weaving our way through it. But there, that's that's just one of the remarkable aspects of the show and and it's a, and they're able to do it i think because there are so many episodes you have the opportunity to to travel this like meandering path like th- through this this dark f- forest of of treachery and and uh, betrayal and new challenges and um and higher level bosses you know <laughs> <laughs> That is, it's just pretty, it's pretty remarkable to, to see it play out. Like it's inspiring. Um, yeah. it's an, it's inspired and it's inspiring to watch. And yeah. like you said, it's got some great battle scenes too. <laughs> yeah. 
And I, I guess, yeah, it might be useful because maybe some of your viewers uh, haven't yeah. seen the previous shows or haven't watched Air Hero, yeah. but uh, just to Go ahead. say, yeah, this is a show which was, I think it was started in 2014. It's a Turkish show um, <clears throat> founded on Netflix. And um, it basically is a, a quasi historic uh, account of the father of the founder of the Ottoman Empire, uh, Osman. So the father of Osman uh, was a, f a figure named Ertuğrul. Now there's not very much data uh, available about who Ertuğrul was. Uh, so there's a lot of leeway, a lot of uh, flexibility creatively for the writers to go in and really just create uh, an epic, uh, a lot of, with a lot of drama. And, and the thing that I found really fresh about this show is that it doesn't stagnate. Like it, it goes through, I, I, I'm always used to waiting for a, a show to lose its creative vitality where, you know, like the Simpsons, you know, or something where at a certain mm -hmm. point, like you're just, this is just randomness. There's no, they're not thinking anymore. There's no more funniness, um, but it doesn't. They, they, they continuously find ways to introduce new types of organizing principles and new types of, of components of the human um, persona that are embedded in the characters that come into the show over time in the scenarios that arise. So there's a constant rejuvenation or, 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 or freshness to, with it, which is, I guess, this resurrection idea, this renaissance idea is, is part of the title of the show itself, which is nice that they're actually following their own title where they're, they're mm -hmm. reviving that spirit, which is I think what a, any t type of healthy society to, to function, there's no formula for success of a republic or, you know, you, but you have to constantly, every generation revive the, 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 the vitality that gave rise to those people who sacrificed um, as the founding fathers are concerned, you know? And if you lose that and people stagnate too much, um, the society loses its found its moral fitness to survive and thrive, and it will be corrupted and it will be uh, taken down um, <clears throat> in the political realities that we face. So the fact that, I mean, there's a lot embedded in this show, but as you pointed out, there's political insights, knowing just knowing a little bit about how world history actually is shaped. Um, it, it, the fact that we have a respect for the the group dynamics of the Mongols, of uh, of their um, what organized that part of society uh, historically for hundreds of years as one dynamic that Ertuğrul is sort of navigating through as one of many Turkish tribes trying to create uh, you know they're, they're Islamic and they're trying to create a society where they define their uh, their vision for. Oh, just wait, we lost you. Matt, uh, lost your audio. Just wait. Is that better? Oh, yeah, that, yep. yeah, you're back. Yep. Okay, just went on strike for some reason. Okay. Um, so you're yeah, talking so, about the Mongols and... Yeah, like, like so the, the, the fact that um, you, you have... Um, you have a society where these Turkish... I mean, Ertuğrul is, is leading a Turkish tribe and charting out a vision of a world... Uh, an, where yes, he's, he's Islamic, but his idea of it isn't like this Islamic state stuff. It's, it's a world where uh, justice is done mm -hmm. and the strong defend the weak, you know, and you have uh, certain characters uh, within it, like uh, uh, Ibn Arabi, who's this character that comes and goes and, and always introduces these higher enlightened lessons that God, to, to, to rule a society justly requires that we respect science and that we we have economic development for the poor. These are ideas that are uh, infused within uh, the series as it goes on. So there's there's a certain truthful organizing, like it's true, no matter what type of society you are, whether it's Christian or, or Muslim or Jewish society, to be in alignment with natural law, you have to do these things. You have to defend justice. You have to see yourself as an instrument of God's will, like mm -hmm. Henry the VII did, mm -hmm. uh, or Louis XI, um, you know, that we discussed earlier today. Yep. And the, 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 the fact that you have him running, ag running up against these cultish Templars and these other subcults of secret societies uh, within the Byzantine Empire. And sure, like I've encountered, obviously like part of me is uncomfortable sometimes the way that, you know, Christianity is sometimes treated a little bit too unidimensionally, like all of the bad guys who don't yeah. have too much complexity yeah. are all like... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> of course they have the but, theme music you know yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> and like, okay, that's not too classy. But at the same time, it's not totally, uh, it's not totally anti-Christian either because there's right. many good Christians within the show too yeah. who are betrayed by bad Christians. Yes. Um, so it's kind of like what Shakespeare does in The Merchant of Venice, you know? Like, yeah, Shakespeare is speaking to a Christian audience and people say, oh, it's an anti-Semitic uh, play. Um, but it's not that that Shylock is bad because he's a Jew. He's bad because he's a bad human being. And he happens to be a Jewish banker. But there's also good Jews, you know, his daughter, another Jewish character. They're good. They're horrified by what Shylock is doing. So Shakespeare, unlike his detractors, are, is not actually being anti-Jewish. You know, he's being anti-bad people. Mm -hmm. um, and they happens to be that, yeah, they're cloaked often in, you know, the case of Shylock, mm -hmm. yeah, he's a Jewish uh, antagonist. And in the case of, like, yeah, tech for uh, Aries or, or yeah. many of the characters, yeah, they're, they're cloaked in the, in, mm -hmm. uh, in the Christian cloth. But, but at the same time, you have an, also an idea of transformation of redemption, which is, again, a powerful part of, of the human experience. It's, if anything, what makes us human is our, our power to not just be corrupted, which is what I think today most cynical people tend to, to think of as like, oh, yeah, what makes a human being special? What makes us different from other animals? It's like, well, we're corrupt. Animals are just pure. It's like, well, okay, they're willing to accept that a good person can be corrupt very easily. But the idea that corrupt people can become good, people have a much more difficult time, I think, contemplating that seriously. But that's been our human history as well. And you can't account for most of universal history if you don't realize this. And there are, they get at that. There's many characters within, from the Mongols, um, from these, these uh, you know, Templar affiliated uh, nut jobs who actually change and, uh, and, and, and become uh, good people. Mm -hmm. So th that's difficult to do. That's not an easy thing to accomplish. And the only time I had ever seen that done is either in certain classical works like the Bible, where you have characters like Saul uh, become Paul on the road to Damascus, you know, and he goes from being like a sociopathic, uh, not even sociopathic, because he's, he's, he is morally, uh, I guess, driven to kill Christians as a, you know, warrior of the Pharisees. But he kills a lot of fucking people and he really is unredemptive. He, he thinks he's totally right about that until he has this moment of, of transformation and uh, ends up becoming um, <clears throat> an advocate of, of Christ's message in the Bible. And before that, you have, you know, some examples of the Furies um, in Sophocles' plays who become the, uh, the Aranes um, at the end of the, uh, the Orestes trilogy. So, you know, these, these terrible vendetta seeking rage ball de quasi deities uh, who are just like chasing poor, you know, Orestes, he made some bad mistakes, but they're like pursuing him and pursuing him. And these are ugly creatures. And by the end, it's resolved beautifully where they're, they're transformed by Athena um, into the Ernies. And so you have examples of that in great, you know, Western, uh, the, the classical matrix, um, which, which are, are great, but we haven't seen a lot of that. I haven't seen any of that in the last, you know, hundred years of, of Western literature. I can't think of any examples where that happens, but they do that in this Turkish show. Well, we, one of the things that we discussed a little bit, trying not to give too many spoilers on that show yeah. was the transformation of one character in particular. And we were all so, I mean, it, it was dramatically so convincing. It was so well done from beginning to end. And you where, wouldn't have been able to predict it from the beginning. No, there's like, no, no, nope. no, this character has, there's irredeemable, irredeemable. I'm never going to like her. <laughs> and, and, and you're going from really like, like seething with, with disgust at her behavior to, you know, 40 episodes later, cheering her on and, and, and celebrating her, her, you know, her newfound elevation, you know, in the eyes of God and herself and her tribe and everything. And it yeah. was... So exactly what you mentioned, Matthew. I mean, it's I haven't I didn't remember seeing anything like that uh, in any other program, and um, it yeah. it it keeps like you said. I mean, it, there there is a uh, the story revitalizes itself constantly. There is this uh, a resurrection of values, and people consolidate their vision again and again to rally their you know what the what the tribe wants to accomplish under the leadership of Erda rule and um it's uh you laugh you cry you know there's uh you enjoy the battles <laughs> you know you uh you you I, all of all of the emotions come up for, oh yeah in this story well there's one um there, well there's a couple of characters in mind that i've that i've seen kind of do this 
uh, switcheroo. Um, and that was um, from Dragon Ball Z. There was a couple of characters. There was Vegeta and Piccolo. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a nerd. And um, also in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, there was Spike. People always forget about Spike, but he was just absolutely horrible and horrendous. And then he goes through the very painful process of fighting for his soul in a literal way. Uh, and That's then right. redeems himself as, as being one of the strongest, you know, uh, group in the, the fight to save humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, an, it's a lot. It's not nearly as satisfying as some of the transformations in Earth World, just because it's, it's a different show. I yeah. mean, and, and it's a and fantasy. It's a fantasy. Yeah. And so they don't really have, and it's a lot shorter. They don't have like, you know, 30 episodes to really explore, you know, the, the kind of personal dimensions of, of character dynamics and everything, mm -hmm. uh, that earth rule does. So, um, like I, I really liked those transformations from before. So then when, when we started watching this show and we started seeing these kinds of transformations, I was like, Oh my gosh, this is exactly what, you know, I was wanting to see in these other ones, but they couldn't never do it. And so when I saw it with this one, it was, the I think I think what I actually said at the time was this is the most satisfying transformation I have ever seen. Yeah, and no, it was just because yeah. Also, as a as a uh, you know I've, I've, uh, as a geek, I uh, I gotta say you know like you 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 have cases in in Marvel comics too. You know you've got cases. Uh, I used to read a lot of comic books uh, in the day, and yeah, like Venom at various points actually uh, walks a good path. You know, and and you have different characters like Magneto um it for storylines coming in and, and and changing his ways and and uh and defending the good um and there's there's many characters and many case studies in comic books and i think the thing that makes the air to rule transformation so satisfying is that it's um unlike the the comic book culture i think they tend to um the motive for why characters do good tends to be reduced to some combination of revenge guilt uh, for like letting Uncle Ben die or, you know, like there, there's something Kantian usually underlying the motive for a lot of the good guys. And that includes also um, the, there's a certain uh, lack of depth for the reasons why we do good or mm -hmm. why we change mm -hmm. from being bad to good, yeah. which mm -hmm. doesn't take into consideration the full depth of the human condition. Whereas I think what makes again, yeah, like the air degree transformations so so satisfying in that show is that yeah they're really doing things for the realization that there's something about their the health of their soul and something that they were they were uh, lacking by not walking on God's path by by living in yeah. dissonance from the actual will of God um, and the will of the unit like the, this creative force of the universe however you want to take it <clears throat> mm -hmm. which I think it ma makes the more durable good guys happen you know like when yeah. we uh, when you look at people who are just willing to just s succumb like Lincoln or whatever to just their, you know, to dying and to putting their, their lives at, at great risk uh, for the sake of their ideals. They're doing it not for any Kantian reason. They really are happy people and they, they love what they love life, but they, they love the health of their soul so much more than the uh, safety of their body. That's why Socrates was able to willingly and happily take the hemlock, yeah. um, you know, because he, he knew that life really wasn't living. If I was going to disobey, if I was going to do something to make my soul more ugly, more unhealthy by disobeying my conscience or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Cicero did the same. Um, so, and so many of the, that's like something which we used to, I think, understand more in the West as, as a part of the human experience and the human psyche and under the last century of Freudian sort of interpretations of the psyche and Darwinian interpretations of, of evolution, we sort of lost that, that, eternal sense of what is the soul what is it that makes us eternal or, or that ties us to the eternal and the divine that's the been, higher connections have just higher been completely yeah. severed mm -hmm. and it's very clear in the air school and air school sort of represents himself like a really integrated person yeah where yeah. there's no conflict with his ideals and uh and his desires so his de mm -hmm. you know his obligations and his will are so in tune that that accompanies these profound insights that other people can't understand because they're still living they, they, they have their their godly ideals but they still live as individuals day to day for personal comfort or like local more reduced uh secondary concerns which are mm -hmm. at, at odds and dissonant 
with their, their principles. So they don't have that insight. They don't have the ability to have that confidence, the courage, and that, that penetrating power to see through processes and conspiracies the way an Ertugul has, and they're, they're very mystified by it. So I think that's another really, really great. Damn, Arturo always with his schemes and trying to be greedy, and that's well, how they see it anyway. The, the yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> the image from the show that came to mind as you were speaking there, Matt, was um, well, Arturo as this integrated character, and one of the things that just it it gets me every time, like it really um, brings a tear to my eye, and it's happened several times, is where. Ertrul is trapped or, you know, he's, he's at the end of his ropes and basically, you know, someone's pointing, holding an, uh, a sword to his throat, you know, so this is the moment where he's going to die. Right. And of course we know he's never going to, he's not going to die in the show because it's his show. But every time that he's, that he's facing death, the actor is so great. Um, he, he's completely calm in the face of death. And he just recites, what's the, what's the Islamic line called? Is it the Shahada or is it something else that they recite before death, you know, before they die? Um, well, he recites oh, the... Oh, I'll, I'll, yeah, that uh, Muhammad is the messenger is and the there's messenger. one God, but Allah. Yeah. Yep. Right. And so he, he recites the line and he's just got this completely serene acceptance of death on his face. Like he is, he's willing to die at any moment and with, with total, total confidence and, and no fear. And there's that's another thing that isn't that you don't you don't see elsewhere really i mean you, you see kind of like in the comic books you might see a facsimile of it you might see like a, a a tough marvel super superhero character or something that that's you know getting in a situation and facing death but it doesn't it doesn't pack a punch for some reason whereas this it's it's totally human and totally believable and totally inspiring at the same time to see to see that that combination of how did you put it of like obligation and will and um and where there's just a totally unified a totally unified human being who uh, almost like a well we we we've talked about Ibn Arabi on the show and we've talked about mysticism we've talked about uh, stoicism but essentially this stoic sage this kind of this totally integrated person who nothing can nothing can um can take that away from them and can take that purity of heart away from yeah. them. So yeah, they're he, they're like really sovereign, and I I, th yeah. I think that's the paradox of of like <clears throat> in the case of the United States. Um, one of the things that that's always been the the battle in the U.S. is to resolve the general welfare principle of the Constitution with the sacredness um, of individual the individual, and they're both beautiful, right? Like to actually have a nation enshrine, enshrining the sacredness of individual liberty. That had never been done before the United States Declaration of Independence. And then to have the, the Constitution with its preamble that asserts that the entire society and the, the laws must be read from the filter that everything must be adherent to the general welfare of the whole. Um, they seem to represent two different opposing uh, ideas that a lot of people have not been able to resolve properly, which is why they often like will characterize uh, Lincoln or JFK who believed in, you know, uh, big government as being tyrannical because they uh, uh, abused certain individual liberties to do whatever we want to do. Um, or Hamilton, you know, they'll, they'll do the same thing there. It, <clears throat> or the inverse, they will, you know, um, consider anybody who just cares about individual rights as being just uh, selfish. Like, you know, and this is being, we see that with like a lot of the, the COVID uh, arguments today, like, oh, you, you care about your individual rights and not wanting to get a vaccine. Aren't you selfish? Uh, yeah, like that, then you got that other distortion. Mm -hmm. So there's been this inability to sort of resolve the two properly, but that's the precondition for sovereignty. So in, in, in America, the, what made the United States so powerful is that it was a nation where everybody was seen as sovereign. It wasn't like you had one, formerly the idea of sovereign was the sovereign, right? The monarch that was born into a hereditary master class mm -hmm. was the sovereign and rights sort of trickled down from the will of the sovereign that could be taken away or given as that sovereign saw fit. Um, so the, to have a whole society of every sovereign citizen being the source of the, you know, like the, a nation ruled by the consent of the governed, right? That's a democratic republic. Um, it doesn't mean that the, every, every single decision is going to be made by everybody in the society, but you have to have that sort of uh, development where everybody cares. Everybody sees themselves as responsible for the orientation of their society regardless of what party you find yourself in. 
Um, so you have to both care about the sacredness of your individual, but you also have to care about the, the whole. You have to be willing to make sacrifices when they're needed, objectively. Mm -hmm. But you also have to be uh, able to reasonably discern what are legitimate sacrifices versus illegitimate sacrifices too, right? Mm -hmm. um, that has to be, so the cultivation of all the mind, the emotions, and the body all have to be happening um, together. And so Ertegrul really has e exemplifies that. There's there's very little, yeah, I mean, that's like sort of the, the, the best role model, which is why I think it brings tears to our eyes to see him in action. Because you're like, okay, that, that's what a human being is supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's like nobody's ever going to achieve that maybe level of, of integration, perhaps. Maybe that maybe that's a little bit too high to expect everybody to, to attain. Yeah. But still, like, it's something natural is there. And we haven't seen so much. We've been hungry and thirsty for it being in a drought of morality that we were born into. That, you know, like you see a bit of oxygen after you've been underwater. You're like, <gasps> <laughs> that's what it's like. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, and, and it's so funny. Um, it, it's it's what is it? Um, well, I, I want just like you when you we started talking about this. You said you tried to introduce some friends to it and haven't been very successful. It's like um, I, I want I really want you to watch this show about a 13th century Turkic mo nomad group. Um, you know, trying to trying to establish a, you know an Islamic. Uh, an, ex an exam Islamic world empire essentially, <laughs> and uh, and it's really great, and you know, it's just it's a hard sell. Um, it's about traditional values. Yeah, but but you know if you can get over that and just watch it, you'll find that uh, it's actually got quite a lot to it, and you know to the to the point where there's I haven't found except like you said, Matt, about some of the some of the kind of cartoonish depictions of the evil Christians, right? Aside from that, there's like, there's absolutely nothing really offensive about it. You know? No, absolutely. I mean, it's got you know, a few, a few, um, a few grown worthy, like plot, plot devices and stuff every once in a while. But you know, that just, yeah. for me, it's more of the fun. actually. <laughs> no, yeah. And it does, I think by introducing, um, a, a, a sane approach to how conspiracies actually happen. Mm. Um, it gives you a lot of insights into yeah, your yeah. own world and how do you actually think, you know? Um, it's not this like fight club version of conspiracy theories, which is how people often tend to disrespect conspiracy theories. Is like, oh yeah, the, you know, it's like fight club. Like everybody is is literally in on it, right? And um, and no, there's like layers of subterfuge and dynamic that he's, that air is constantly navigating through and uh, operating on a counterintelligence level. And when you mm -hmm. actually re look at history um, from the standpoint of, of counterintelligence um, from both the good guys and the bad guys, you look at Benjamin Franklin subverting and, in, you know, uh, infiltrating the hellfire clubs of London and bringing in Intel back to his network in, in the United States on, uh, on Isaac Newton and uh, Bernard Mandeville and all these things like there's there's layers that they're setting up traps uh he, Ben Franklin is the master of deception of, of constantly getting the, his enemies uh to to think he's going to do one thing and he does another thing and he's already set you up several like he's already operating like you know 80 steps in the future and setting up all these different contingency plans which is where you know like uh, I, I did this class a little while ago and I, I don't want to talk about the class right now but I'm just going to throw it out there yeah as a teaser on, you know, like uh, one of his key allies uh, is a figure that he brings in from Pennsylvania and he sets him up as a painter uh, with certain networks that he's cultivated in the Lunar Society in, in, in Britain, which is also behind the creation of, of the industrial activity of Manchester that gives rise to the uh, industrial revolution in uh, Britain. It was ironically Ben Franklin doing that in American. It wasn't anything indigenous to the British empire. And he has networks like uh, Joseph Wright of Derby who's a, a great painter in Britain, part of the Lunar Society. Uh, Joseph Priestley is another one. Erasmus Darwin, Darwin's grandfather, who's actually a really good guy, was also a part of that. And, uh, and Benjamin West is brought into this network and ends up creating the uh, British Royal Academy of Fine Arts to create a, a, a cultural revolution to bring back the best anti-imperial cultural and aesthetical traditions into Britain itself, um, which totally flanks the empire. Like They didn't expect any of that stuff to happen. You know, and he's doing this 15 years before the American Revolution. He's he's planting tons of seeds, and and his discovery of electricity is is integrated into his future plans for uh, not just a revolution in science, but it was to the, the the creation of the republic was part of part and parcel of his designs for discovering the nature of electricity, harnessing it, and sharing it. Um, so you have 
characters like that. You and and so the fact that Ertugrul, people have I've I've seen criticisms online of people saying, oh, nobody could think like Ertugrul, like he's always on top of things, he's always ten steps ahead. It's like that's part of our history, you know, like that people operate that way. Well, and I'd say I'd just say kind of a a hard no to that because in the first season, like they're always getting trapped and they're falling for all the traps, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it it's Ertugrul is actually learning from each of those. Uh, new new lessons like new new traps basically like he's once he's been trapped once or twice using the same method it's not going to happen again unless they you know they the the bad guys up their game so he's he's constantly learning and so like that was one of the one of the things that kind of annoyed me during the first season I'm like oh it's, you know, all these ambushes they're always working all the time when are, when are they going to learn mm-hmm. and then you know season two comes around and, okay they've learned you know mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, Mm-hmm. And some people, mm-hmm. some people, some people just have that level of, like, just on the level, um, uh, on the topic of that level of insight, you know, because oftentimes people will be saying, "Oh, what's going on here?" And Ertel will say, "Well, it's obvious. This person's thinking this, and he wants to do this because this, and, you know." And he, and he lays it all out, and that's of course what's happened. But there are people like that, just like you're saying. Like there are people in history, and it's just some people are just that insightful about what's going on and how to read people's motivations and how to how to see the, the the dynamics that aren't obvious on the surface of things exactly it's the motives like they're they're looking on the domain of what is organized in that person's heart and you know that there's almost like a species character like a cat will be a cat um no matter what scenario you put it in it'll be a cat it's not going to start tr- you know flying like a like a bird mm-hmm. um for the most part and um, so it's kind of, I mean, human beings are kind of like that too. There, there's certain personality types that, you know, if you haven't resolved certain things or you, you believe certain things, then I can put you in no matter what scenario and you will have certain preordained or pre, uh, determined reactions and impulses according to, to, that you will react according to. Um, and this is what, you know, Shakespeare as well. He's trying to get us to understand this by introducing characters like Iago in uh, Othello. You know, and Iago is is a, a master intelligence sort of archetype from representing Venice. He, and, and, you know, Othello is a Moorish uh, he, uh, general who's uh, operating for the Venetian army. Um, he's got a lot of successes under his belt. He's a, a, seen as a really great man and he's got a lot of virtues. Um, but he also has a, a problem where he really believes that Iago, honest Iago, his close friend, uh, really is trustworthy. He has a reputation, right, of being just the most trustworthy guy. And Iago is just animated by very nefarious intentions that Othello and others can, cannot see. And he's just and he's able to profile everybody so that he knows how they're going to react when he plants certain seeds of inside their minds. Whether it's jealousy that, hey, you know, I, I heard uh, your wife Desdemona is uh, having a thing with your other buddy. Uh, forgot his name. And uh, he's able to just sort of as soon as he awakens the jealousy and the insecurity that he's identified is there within Othello as, you know, a, a black man from Africa operating in a European world. He's got a lot of insecurities, a lot of prejudices against him, and he's able to capitalize on those things to get um, Othello to just completely go against his own better nature and, uh, and act very tragically. And I'm not going to spoil it for people who haven't read the play, but, uh, but yeah, like Shakespeare is definitely trying to get us to understand how, humanity is organized by group dynamics which is an expression of individual psychology and how the empire utilizes their knowledge of these things to maintain their control by getting their victims to divide and and be conquered you know to fight each other and destroy each other um where in reality our true interest is in working together regardless of our different cultures and religions and whatever we have universal characteristics that every time that society has organized themselves to operate on what what makes us human, which is that we all know we're going to die. We, we're the only species that's self-conscious of our mortality long before it happens. It's built into our, our awareness of, of, our, our, of our existence, which then opens up the door to the next question, which is, well, what's the purpose of our existence? What's the purpose of our happiness, of legitimate higher happiness versus lower order ephemeral happiness that could, be, uh, that could lead to destruction? Um, what are the universal sentiments that we should cultivate and try to feed more and, and, and not feed the lower... Uh, order sentiments that that bring us into self destruction. Mm-hmm. So all of these things are are parts of whether you're Muslim, whether you're Jew, whether you're Hindu, whether whether you're atheist, whatever. Those are just parts of human nature. And empires will 
capitalize on their knowledge of that to exploit. And um, great leaders like Ben Franklin um, or, or Colbert or you name it, um, I, I think Putin and Xi Jinping today are, are, are operating on by leading the win-win, uh, you know, the idea of win-win cooperation guiding the multipolar alliance and the Eurasian alliance. Um, I think that they very much have tapped into that source, even though we're seeing certain strategic decisions that are maybe not wise coming out of China lately. I think overall they're operating on that paradigm um, with the Christian cultural matrix of, of, you know, Putin and anybody, they're basically saying everybody can join us with big projects for win-win advantage to everybody, uh, orientations, which is really good. And that, I think that scares the hell out of the empire, which is why I think also they're putting so much, they're fueling so many flames of prejudice in the, uh, the pro Trump support base right now, which is, you know, falling prey to, uh, to fearing any type of big government. There's a hyper uh, radical libertarianism that I think has embedded itself philosophically into a lot of the, the, the pro-Trump uh, patriots who see everything big government as being evil. So they see China, which is central government, and they just see it as evil. So they're very easily falling prey to the idea that, oh yeah, it's not British intelligence running the, uh, the color revolution in America. It's really, you know, China and Venezuela. It's like, whoa, like calm down. You're, you're skipping steps here. There's, there's, there's another causal Iago that's not China running around starting fires. Well, uh, that's interesting that you go into that direction because that's something I wanted to discuss with you at some point as well. But that is a whole conversation in and of yeah, maybe itself. Maybe we should save for that sure. for a future. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because we're. We're going, uh, we've already gone an hour and 45 minutes or something like that. So I think and I feel we can go another hour and 45 minutes yeah. with, without any, uh, without any issue. But, um, I just wanted to say, Matt, what a pleasure it is to, to speak with you today. And, uh, like I said, I mean, we, we could, I, and I hope we do, uh, sometime in the near future, get together again and, and discuss, uh, a lot of the topics that you cover in your articles and in your lectures that, uh, that we didn't get to, uh, discuss today you're like i was thinking at one point I, you know I, I wish i had this guy as my professor in college <laughs> because you're you're one of your gifts and of course there's a lot of hard work behind it is all the, all this research you put in in creating context within context within context and it's wonderful so uh tipping my hat to you my friend and, i mean <laughs> And, and, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I do want to just remind our viewers that uh, you can catch a lot of uh, Matthew's articles on SOT. Uh, a lot of them are originally posted at uh, the Canadian Patriot.org and the Rising Tide Foundation.net. Uh, your, your work is also seen on uh, Strategic Culture Foundation website, as well as a few others, I think. Yeah. And Fort Roos, Duran. Probably, a lot of people probably repost your stuff. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah that, that's a, that's the thing in the alternative media world. As soon yeah. as you post it somewhere, often it, it finds it goes itself everywhere. <laughs> a thousand other set, sites. Yeah, but honestly, guys, yeah, like thank you very much for having this show. I, I don't think that this type of content and discussion happens. I, I don't I don't know where else it would be able to happen other than on a show like yours. It's so it's great that you've made a platform for this type of dialogue to occur. Great, thank you. It's a pleasure. And anytime, yeah, you want to continue a dialogue, um, yeah, let me know. I'm, I'd be happy to uh, to join you guys. Yeah, that, that's a near guarantee. Cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks again, Matt. Thank you. Take care. We'll be in touch. For sure. All right. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Okay.